Amen, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. By the way, how many of you in the course of this series, sometime during the week, sometime during the day, have had that song come to your head and you just couldn't get it out of your head? I see, I see several hands out there. That's one of those songs that kind of has a catchy tune, but it also has an important message, and so I hope you've paid attention. Our message this morning is the testimony of Jesus. This morning, we're going to look at something that I think is one of the most interesting subjects in Bible prophecy and maybe one of the most misunderstood. In fact, as the Christian world continues to push forward into the 21st century, I know that there are people out there who are actually abusing this subject. They're twisting it into something the Bible never intended. So as always, we're going to go straight to the pages of the Bible and make sure that we understand. So before we get started, let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessings that you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity that you give us each week. This special palace and time that you've set aside for us. Where we come away from the works that we do and rest in the salvation that Jesus gives. And I pray, Father, that we will appreciate that salvation so much that we will order our lives your way. And as we enter into your word this morning, Father, I pray that each person here will have an open heart and an open mind and learn something. Send your spirit to that end in Jesus' name. Amen. In the course of this series, we studied the remnant movement of Bible prophecy, what God's last day people will be like, and we've discovered that this remnant movement has a number of distinctive identifying characteristics. First of all, it has to be a worldwide movement because it goes to every kindred, nation, tongue, and people. Secondly, it has to be preaching that the judgment hour is already here, not that it's coming, but that it's already here. Thirdly, they have to be calling the world to return to a distinctive worship of God as creator, which includes the fourth commandment. Fourthly, fourthly, they have to be telling the world that Babylon is falling and calling God's people to come out of Babylon, to come out of spiritual confusion. They need to be warning the people to avoid the mark of the beast, something we studied just last night. They have to keep the commandments of God, not two of them, not nine of them, but all ten of them. And then we read in Revelation 12, 17 that the remnant church, not only do they keep the commandments of God, but it says they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So the Bible's description of the remnant church is very specific, and we've discovered that there's only one thing in all the world's history that matches that description exactly. Now this morning, I want to return to that description, and I want to go just a little bit deeper so let's go back to Revelation chapter 12 one more time and see what it says. Verse 17, it says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. This is the old King James Version I'm quoting from here. Went to make war with the remnant of her seed. What's a remnant, by the way? It's what's left over. When you go to a carpet store, if they sell you a remnant, it's what's left over from the original roll, right? So, so there, there was an original church that Jesus established when he was here, and there all through time have been a people, there have been a remnant that's left over that are following the true teachings of what Jesus taught us. But it says, the devil went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, that's one of the identifying characteristics of the remnant, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So let's start with an observation here. When we say the remnant church, what do we mean? Do that, does that mean we think that we're better than other people? No. Does that, that, does that mean we think we're the only ones out there that can be saved? Absolutely not. Because the Bible is very clear that the remnant must keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's the biblical definition of the remnant. Now, if you remember from your Bible, 
you'll recall that God has always had a remnant people at every critical juncture in salvation history. In the days of the flood, he had Noah. In the days of Babylon's rising influence, he called Abraham out of Chaldea. And then he raised up a nation that would demonstrate the plan of salvation right at the very crossroads of the ancient world, the children of Israel. When Ahab married a pagan queen named Jezebel and led Israel into the worship of pagan idols, God raised up a prophet by the name of Elijah who found seven 7,000 remnant people who had not bowed the knee to Baal. And in the New Testament, as the temple was declared desolate for the last time, God raised up a remnant New Testament church. So the pattern for the last days is really nothing new. As the whole world began to move out of the Dark Ages, God began to raise up one more remnant people, one, one group of believers from every walk of life that make up his remnant, his people that are following his way. And we know exactly who that remnant is because it says she keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus. Now that last phrase, the testimony of Jesus, that is actually a very specific expression and you find it elsewhere in the Bible and it has a very specific meaning. So let me show you something kind of interesting here. In Revelation chapter 19, the angel appears to John and John does something that he really should do, if you remember. He's overwhelmed by the appearance of an angel, and so he falls down and worships him. And of course, that's a big no-no because we should only worship God. So I want you to listen to what the angel says because it's fascinating. He says, And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant. Say that with me. I am your fellow servant. Listen. And of your brethren who have, what does it say? Yes. Who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Listen now. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So according to this angel, what is the testimony of Jesus? It's the spirit of prophecy. So now we know the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now we know. But what exactly does that mean? Well, fortunately, the Bible gives us a little more detail. The same thing happens just a few verses later. The angel appears again, and again, John bows down to worship, and again, the angel tells him not to do it. But I want you to watch this carefully. This is Revelation chapter 22 now. It says, Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, pay attention here, the prophets. Follow me carefully now. Revelation 19 and Revelation 22 are parallel passages with slightly different details. A moment ago, the angel said, I am your fellow servant and I am of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Now he says, I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren the what? The prophets. The only difference, that's the only difference in these two verses. In one verse, the angel is of the brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. In the next verse, he's of the brethren, the prophets. Why? Well, because the prophets are the ones who have the testimony of Jesus. When, when the Bible talks about the testimony of Jesus, it's actually talking about the prophetic gift. That's why it says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Let me show you. Paul actually talks about this gift in his first letter to the Corinthian church. He says, Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift. No what? No gift. Listen. Eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So according to Paul, the believers in Corinth had a special gift. It said they had the testimony of Christ and they were waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this isn't just talking about a spiritual gift. It's talking about a specific spiritual gift. It's talking about prophecy. That is something that God gives the church to help them get the work finished and prepare the world for the second coming of Christ. A spiritual gift is something that all believers get. It's a special ability that God gives you to help you participate in the work of the church. And in the Bible, you find several passages that tell us what some of those gifts are. Here's an example in Ephesians chapter 4. It says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. 
Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So when Jesus went back to heaven, the Bible says he gave us spiritual gifts, special abilities that help you and I to accomplish the work of God. He gave us all, all the resources we need to get our assignment finished. And the Bible teaches that every single believer has been given one or more of those gifts. I want you to listen as Paul continues here. It says, And he himself gave some to be apostles. That's a gift. Some prophets. That's another gift. Some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. What does that word edifying mean? I remember... I was down in South America, down in Venezuela, in Caracas, doing a series of meetings. And you know how much I like to talk if you've been around me at all. I like to talk a little too much. And it was very frustrating being down there because, well, because I don't know Spanish. And so I had, back then, they didn't have these little things where you could talk into them and translate to them. So I had my little, my little, not a phone, my, my little dictionary there with me. And I'm looking up these Spanish words and I'm trying to explain to people. And there's this one little girl, her name was Elizabeth. We were, we were just at the very end of our time there. They were giving us a bus tour of Caracas. And then they took us out to the beach that day. And I remember this little girl. She was such a cute little girl. If I could have put her in my suitcase and brought her home, she'd be here today. But, but I couldn't do that anyway. So, but she sat right in the, we were in a bus, and she sat right in the, the, the seat in front of us. And she turned around towards us. And she's trying to help me learn Spanish. And unlike most Venezuelans, Venezuelans have even a rough, even Spanish people have, it's a heavy accent that they have. It's a little bit of a, you know, rustic kind of Spanish that they speak. But this little girl, she was not only cute, she spoke very clearly and very precisely. And she would point at something and say what it was and make me say it. And we were going down there. And then she pointed at this great big office building. And she said, edificio, Ed which means big building, I came to learn. But that, that's the same root that we get the word edify from, which means to build up. Right? So when the gifts are given, they're given to us for the edifying of the body of Christ. In other words, they're given to us to build up the church, to equip us for the ministry. It's, they're not given so that we can entertain ourselves or show other people how blessed or talented we are. The gifts were given specifically for doing the work that God asked us to do. You see, you and I... When we come into the church, we are not to be spectators. Each of us has a work to do. We are supposed to participate in the life of the church together with other believers. You are supposed to add your gifts to the gifts of everybody else in the body of Christ. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, but if you look at me, I probably don't look that much like Jesus to you. And if I look at you, you may not look exactly like Jesus to me or you or you or you, anybody else. None of us individually look like God because none of us individually has every gift. You understand what I'm saying? But when you get all of us together, moving in unison together, working together, we begin to look like God to the world. Not because we're so good, but because God has given us gifts and as we get busy with them, people get to see what God really looks like. It's very important. So you're supposed to, you're supposed to accomplish your part of what God has asked you to do in the church. And everybody has a different part. And there are no exceptions, by the way. Every believer has gifts. In that list of gifts, in that list of gifts, it says that some will be prophets. In fact, that's the one gift that's listed in every single list of the spiritual gifts that are listed in the Bible. And they're listed in several places. But every time, there's one gift that's mentioned in every list, and that's the gift of prophecy. Let me show you. Here's another one in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It says, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits. But did you notice that? To another prophecy. Don't miss that. To another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one, individually as he wills. Let me just point out a couple of things about that passage. First of all, it says the Holy Spirit gives gifts to each one, which means everybody has a gift. 
Everybody has something valuable to contribute to the life of the church. Secondly, it also says the Spirit decides who gets what gifts. And the reason I point that out is because there are many people out there who will tell you that if you really know Jesus, you must get a specific gift, and all the high-level Christians will get that same gift, but according to the Bible, that is not true. God decides which gift you get. It says he, he distributes each one to each one individually as He wills. And thirdly, I want you to notice that the gift of prophecy was in the list again. In fact, it's there every single time in every list in the Bible. And I'll be honest. Sometimes that bothers me because every so often someone will walk up to me and say, Pastor Pepper, I have a message for the, from the Lord for you. And then they'll go off into the twilight zone. In fact, when I was pastoring in a church in Charleston, West Virginia, I had a lady who came to me before the Sabbath service started one Sabbath. And she said, Pastor Pepper, you might know this, but I've been given the gift of prophecy. And God has told me that I'm going to share a message with your church today. And I'm like, oh, oh are you? <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, I'm, I'm like, I, what, so what is your message? Oh, no, I'm not supposed to tell you. I'm just supposed to stand up and, 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 and share the message. I said, well, I would really like to hear what this message you have to share is. And she says, are you questioning my gift of prophecy? I said, I'm not questioning that the gift of prophecy will be there in God's last day church. But the Bible says to test the prophets and you don't even tell me what you're saying. How can I even test what you're having to say? So no, you're not getting up. And I never saw her in church again. But anyway, it, 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 it bothers me. My first 10 reactions, if somebody comes to me and says, I've got the gift of prophecy, my first 10 reactions are, yeah, right. What's wrong? You understand what I'm saying? Am I, can I just be honest with you? So it bothers me to think that some people might have the gift of prophecy and yet I have to accept it as possible because the Bible mentions it in every single list in these gifts of the Spirit were given to God's people clear to the end of time. So I have to accept it. And on top of that, the Bible says very specifically that you and I should expect to see this gift in the last days. Not just all the gifts, but this one in particular. It says it in the book of Acts, but I want to take it from its original source there in the book of Joel. Listen to what it says. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. In fact, you know how it words it in the book of Acts? It says, and it shall come to pass in the last days that your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men dream dreams and your young men have visions. All right? So Joel mentions that we should expect to see the gift, the prophetic gift in conjunction with the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it's also mentioned in the book of Acts. In other words, in the last days, God says the prophetic gift will be found among God's people. So really, I have no choice. I have to accept that it's possible because the Bible says it's going to happen. And yet, if, if, if somebody says they have that gift, I don't want to take his or her word for it because Jesus was very clear that in the last days there will be false prophets as well. Just because somebody claims they're a prophet doesn't mean they are a prophet. You remember what Jesus said in the book of Matthew? For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive. If possible, even the very elect. Now, there's something important here that I don't want us to miss. Jesus said that when these false prophets arise, they're going to show great signs and wonders. And that means that even a miracle is no guarantee that something comes from God. Someone might come along who says or does things that defy explanation, but that still doesn't prove anything because according to Jesus, even false prophets are going to be able to do amazing things. Now listen to me carefully. A miracle is not proof that something is true. Not according to the Bible. You still have to check everything you see against the Word of God. It doesn't matter if they're performing miracles. If what they're saying is against the Word of God, then we need to question that. So how should we handle this? We have to accept that it's possible because the Bible says so, but at the same time, we need to be careful because the Bible also says there are going to be false prophets. So how can you tell the difference? That's the big question. With all of the religious confusion taking place in the world, I want to be really sure that I'm not falling for deception. 
The book of Revelation tells me that the spirits of demons are going to go out into the world in the last days performing miracles, faking spiritual gifts, deceiving the nation. So I want to be absolutely sure that I always know the truth. And the truth is based on what? What the Bible says. So how can you tell the difference? Well, the Bible makes it really easy. First of all, it tells us to test all things. Did you know that? Look what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast that which is good. So you and I are not supposed to reject prophesying out of hand because it might be the real thing, but the Bible says we need to test it and only pay attention if it passes the test. So how do you test it? Well, the Bible actually gives us some really good guidelines here. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not trying to put God in a box and say he can only do certain things when he's giving prophets messages. In fact, there are instances in the Bible where God breaks these rules. But generally speaking, the Bible gives some really good tests for a prophet. First of all, if God were to actually reveal the future to someone, he's not going to make a mistake. So a person with the genuine gift of prophecy is going to get things right. They're going to have predictive accuracy. If God is the source of their message, the message needs to be true because God cannot lie and God does not make mistakes. So if I were to tell you that God told me in no uncertain terms that tonight at 8.05 p.m. a terrorist was going to fly a plane into your house and at 8.06 p.m. your house was still standing, what would you make of my prophetic gift? You'd have some really solid reasons to question it, wouldn't you? Because God doesn't get things wrong. Look what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 18. It says, When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. So God simply doesn't make mistakes. A real prophet has to get it right every single time, with just one exception. There is such a thing as a conditional prophecy. A prophecy that will only come to pass if certain conditions are met. For example, the prophet Jonah told the people of Nineveh because he got a message from God and he related it to the people of Nineveh that there would be, their city would be destroyed in 40 days. Yet 40 days and 40 nights and Nineveh will be destroyed. That was the message of Jonah out there. I'm suggesting that that was a conditional prophecy. You see... The Bible says the people repented and the city wasn't destroyed. Of course, if you read the book of Jonah, and I have done this skeptically many times, if you read the book of Jonah, it doesn't sound like a conditional prophecy, does it? Yet 40 days and 40 nights, Nineveh will be destroyed unless you repent. There's never an unless you repent at the end of his statement. Are you with me here? But think with me. If it wasn't a conditional prophecy, then why did God give them 40 days before he destroyed them? Was he simply trying to give them 40 days of abject terror? That's not the loving God that I know. A better explanation is that he was calling on them to repent. In fact, God was willing to change his mind if they repented. God gave them a real choice as a city to make. I want you to look at this from the book of Jonah itself. It says, Then God saw their works, that they had turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster which he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Folks, that is indicative of the fact that God responds to our heart changes. If we change, he changes with us. And Well, not that he changes, but he, he'll move with us. He'll, he'll respond to our change. I don't want to say he changes with us because God doesn't change. But look what the Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. The implication of that verse is if the people don't change and they don't pray and they don't turn from their wicked ways, what's God going to do? He's not going to respond in the same way. So clearly, God responds to our heart changes even when He's revealed His love through prophecy and sought for us to change. But other than that, if someone says the Lord told them it would happen, and it doesn't, then it's simply not true. So let's take this biblical test and apply it to some of the best-known so-called prophets of the day. 
Let's apply it to Nostradamus. How many of you have heard of Nostradamus? Everybody talks about Nostradamus. He was a French prognosticator who lived in the 1500s. And he's a fascinating character and a lot of people are absolutely convinced that he had the gift of prophecy. So much so that you can still buy his books today. I'm pretty sure when he wrote them he didn't think anybody would be reading his books 500 years later. But they are. A few years ago an acquaintance of mine sat down and looked through Nostradamus's work. And during his lifetime, the French prophet wrote out 449 major prophecies. And of those, only 18 have been proven wrong. People say, well, that's, that's actually pretty amazing, right? Only 18 wrong? But let me ask you, is 18 the same as 100% right? No, it isn't. And God wouldn't get 18 wrong. But still, it seems pretty amazing until you consider the fact that 390 of his prophecies don't fit anything that's ever happened in the history of the world. So at the end of the day, his real accuracy rate is 9%. Now, let me ask you, would you trust a dentist with a 9% accuracy rate? How about your heart surgeon? You have a 91%, you have a, you have a 9 chance of living if we do this surgery. Go ahead, doc. See what you got, right? You're not going to do that. So, so why would you trust your eternal future to a man who used methods forbidden by Scripture and only got it right 9% of the time? So he's not a prophet. At least not a prophet of God. Now, there are some people out there that do better than 9%, like Jean Dixon. Any of you old enough to remember when she was so famous back in the 70s? I see several hands up out there. She was very popular back then. And some people estimate that she was right 30 to 60% of the time. But again, even if it's as high as 60%, would God get it wrong 40% of the time? Absolutely not. The same is true of Edgar Case, who is often referred to as the sleeping prophet. And for just about every other person the world calls a prophet. At any rate, we need to test the prophets. And one of the tests is if their predictions come true. So that's test number one. If they're making predictions, they need to be true. Test number two. If someone has the genuine gift of prophecy, they have to be faithful to the Word of God. They have to agree with the Bible. Why? Because God doesn't change His mind about the information that are written in this book. In fact, we believe that so strongly that we have a motto that we have done every single meeting of the series. I was going to say night, but this isn't a night. Every single meeting of the series, we have a motto. Do you remember what it is? If it's in the Bible, and if it's not in the Bible, folks, that's a life-changing motto. That's a life-changing motto. And there's a lot of information in this book that we can come together on and look at. So if God were to give somebody a message in our day, and if that message really comes from God, then it has to agree with the Bible. Here's what the Bible says. If there arises among you, and this is in Deuteronomy 13, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams saying, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So if a so-called prophet disagrees with the Bible, then you know that their gift does not come from God. Even if that person does amazing things, even if they manage to get all their predictions right 100% of the time, if they disparage the Bible, if they go against the clear teaching of the Word of God, they are not the real thing. Here's another Bible text to prove that. It says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So if a so-called prophet does not agree with God's word, then you need to go the other way. If they don't agree with God's law, or if they encourage you to break it, it's not the real thing. In fact, the Bible seems to indicate that the genuine gift of prophecy won't even be there among people who refuse to listen to God's law. This is significant. If they don't keep God's law, they won't even have prophecy. Look what it says in the book of Lamentations. It says, The law is no more, and her prophets find no vision from the Lord. This is something that actually happened with King Saul. You remember he stopped walking with God. He became disobedient. And at that point, all prophetic communication stopped. The prophet Samuel died. And after that, there was no more word from the Lord. So if you remember the story... What did Saul do? 
He went out and he sought a spiritualist for advice and it ended up costing him his life. So now we have these two tests. A genuine prophet has to get things right if they're making predictions. They also have to agree with the Bible. And then the Bible says that if God really communicates with someone, he's not going to use Ouija boards or tea leaves or crystal balls or the palm of somebody's hand. He's going to use dreams and visions. And the Bible makes this very clear. Look what it says in Numbers 12, 6. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Here's another text. This one comes from Joel chapter 2. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. You can also find that in Acts chapter 2. Of course, this actually rules out most of the people who claim to have the prophetic gift today. It rules out channelers and psychics who say that ascended masters and space aliens are speaking to them. It also rules out crystal ball readers and tarot card readers and palm readers and, and people who talk to the dead at seances in the middle of the night. If their messages were really coming from God, they'd be coming in dreams and visions. That's what it says. Because God speaks directly to the mind. And if you think about it, this actually makes really good sense because it offers perfect encryption, if you will. The Bible teaches that the devil cannot read your mind, and so God speaks through dreams and visions, and the devil can't intercept that message and twist the meaning of it. And that brings us to our next point. If someone has a dream or vision from God, sometimes they absolutely quit breathing. Now this is not really a test as much as it is a manifestation. This is just the way that dreams and visions appear to happen. I want you to listen to what happened to Daniel when he went into vision. Daniel chapter 10 says, As for me, no strength remains in me, nor is any breath left in me. So when someone goes into vision, we should expect to see their breathing stop. And if you think about it, this would be really hard to fake. If someone claims to be having a vision, try pinching their nose shut and see how long the vision lasts. It's kind of hard to counterfeit this. And then, at least sometimes, people exhibit supernatural strength while in vision. Here's another example from the life of Daniel. Listen to this. It says, Then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. If you remember, at first, Daniel collapses on the floor. He becomes exceedingly weak. And then an angel comes and strengthens him supernaturally. So there you have it. Five things to watch for. A real prophet is going to get it right 100% of the time. A real prophet is going to agree with the Bible. A real prophet is going to hear from God in dreams and visions. A real prophet may stop breathing when in vision. And sometimes they'll be accompanied by supernatural strength. And I just want to pause here and mention what the real definition of prophecy is in Scripture. Sometimes when we think of prophecy in modern English language, we think, well, that's somebody that predicts the future. That's a prophet, right? That's what we think of. In Bible, in, in, in the way the Bible explains a prophet is someone who receives a message from God and delivers it to the people. That's the definition of a prophet in the Bible. Someone who receives a message from God and delivers it to the people. And I'm not talking about just someone who's writing a sermon and preaching it to you. I'm talking about someone who's actually receiving dreams and visions or messages from God and delivering it to the people. And if the message is really from God, guess what? It is going to be accurate. And it is going to agree with the Word of God. And we can know that for sure 100% of the time. So it's a really hard to fake the real gift of prophecy. And of course the big question is, is does it still happen? That's a fair question. Well, we have to expect it because the Bible told us to watch for it. So yes, it must still happen, and I'm convinced it does. After all, prophecy is one of the gifts of the Spirit, and the gifts of the Spirit are going to be in the church until Jesus comes. So this morning, would you like to see a case study of somebody that I believe actually had the gift of prophecy? I think you're going to find this very interesting. Her name was Ellen Harmon, and she was born in 1827. Later on, she married a man by the name of James White, and most people today know her as Ellen White. And she was a rather remarkable person. In fact, the Smithsonian recently named her as one of the 100 most influential Americans of all time. That's quite astounding. 
As a young girl, she gave her heart to Jesus at a Methodist gathering. Then a few weeks later, when she was 17, people say that something remarkable happened at a prayer meeting she was attending. They say she had a vision in front of a group of believers. It was a vision of people making their way to heaven on a very narrow path. They were leaving the world and following Jesus to the heavenly promised land. So at first glance, it looks perfectly biblical. But the Bible tells us to test the gifts to be really sure. Over the course of her lifetime, people say that she had more than 2,000 such experiences. So the question is, was her gift the real thing? Well, let's put it to the test. First of all, if her gift was the real thing, then she had to be accurate because God's not going to make mistakes. So if Ellen White said that God told her something that was going to come to pass, did it actually happen? It would appear so. Back in 1902, she warned the people of San Francisco and Oakland that they were becoming very wicked cities and God had shown her that he was going to deal with them if they didn't change their ways. On another occasion, she told people that she had seen the buildings shaking like reeds in the winds and fires burning all over the city and nobody paid her much mind until 1906 when the big earthquake that all of us know about suddenly wiped out San Francisco. To this day, it is still ranked as one of the most devastating earthquakes of all time. More than 3,000 people died and 80% of the city was destroyed. The fires that started as a result of that earthquake burned for days on end. And then further back in 1864, Ellen White said something that most people of her day laughed at. She said the Lord had shown her that tobacco is a poison of the most deceitful and malignant kind. Notice that word malignant. Cancer causing kind. She said that people were going to discover that smoking was dangerous. And she said that God's people should stay away from cigarettes because they're killers and they need to protect the temple that God gave them. And the people of the day, the doctors of the day, actually laughed to scorn because back then, guess what? Doctors were actually prescribing cigarettes as a cure for lung ailments. Can you believe that? Trust the experts. <laughs> but today, nobody's laughing because we all know that smoking is killing us. But here's the amazing thing. This little lady knew it before anybody else. In fact, it wasn't until 1957, almost 100 years later, that the American Heart Association finally concluded that smoking actually causes lung cancer. Medical science didn't catch up with Ellen White for almost 100 years. Now, my dad, when I was growing up, he's a Methodist. All right? And I remember when I was about 10 years old, I was out playing with my friends, and one of them said, you want to smoke? <laughs> yeah. So I took a cigarette, and I smoked my first cigarette, right? Well, when I got home, what do you think happened? Because neither my mom or dad smoked. What do you think happened? They smelled the cigarettes on me. What have you been doing? What have you been? Oh, no, I was at the Rollins' house. He was a good friend, and they always smoked there. No, this is different. This is on your bed. You've been smoking, boy. My dad took me in, and he gave me a whooping. Well, the next day, because I'm a slow learner, I went out to play with my friends again. Hey, you want to smoke? Yeah, and then I tried to drink a lot of water. And, well, guess what happened when I got home that evening? They knew my, and I remember my dad, he said, boy, you a slow learner. And he gave me a series of whippings over the next several days that by, I knew by the time I, the Surgeon General didn't have to tell me that cigarette smoking was dangerous to your health. I knew that the third cigarette was going to kill you. <laughs> All right? And so I, I'm so thankful that I was raised by a dad that wasn't going to have any part of that. People tell me whippings don't work. And I said, boy, you ain't never been whooped. All right? And some people probably would want to call that child abuse. But I'm telling you, whatever it was, it was very effective. And I'm thankful because because I think my parents by that time knew I was pretty hard-headed and hard to get across to. But how did Ellen White know this 90 years in advance of the medical community? How'd she figure this one out? Listen to this. In 1906, she said, the x-ray is not the great blessing that some suppose it to be. If used unwisely, it may do much harm. Now, why did she say that? Because in 1906, the x-ray was actually more of a sideshow novelty. People were using it for entertainment. You could go to the carnival and pay a few cents and have your x-ray taken for fun. Nobody had any idea that it was dangerous, but today we all know it's dangerous because the x-ray technician covers you up in a lead apron and leaves the room, right? So how did a humble woman with a third grade education figure this out before anyone else? How'd she know this one? In 1893, she started to describe the electrical force of the brain. That's her words. 
And of course, the people of the day laughed at her because nobody really knew how the brain operated. But today I can tell you nobody's laughing because guess what? She was right with a third grade education. So did she pass the test? It would seem so. In fact, at one point, she even stood up in church in Michigan and predicted that the American Civil War was going to happen before it happened. And she told the congregation, some of you are going to die in that war. And many of the people in the congregation that day laughed until it actually happened. And how exactly did she know all that stuff? Somehow, with a third grade education, consider this, with a third grade education, Ellen White has become the most translated female author in the history of the world. How did that happen? She wrote hundreds of thousands of pages. One of her books was about the biblical principles of education. It was entitled Education. And on one occasion, the minister of education from Norway was visiting the United States and he read her book and he was so impressed that today, much of the Norwegian school system is still based on her book, even though she never made it past the third grade. How did that happen? Think about this. A lady with a third grade education writes a book and on the basis of that book, you have the world's second largest parochial school system. Thousands and thousands of schools and colleges and universities all around the world. In fact, my wife teaches at one of them in Parkersburg. It is a very effective, highly regarded, and large school system on the basis of a lady with a third grade education. You've got to ask yourself, without the Spirit of God, how could that be? But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to the tests. Test number one, they've got to be predictively accurate, and that appears to be true. Test number two, they've got to agree with the Bible. If someone puts themselves above the Bible or dismisses the teachings of the Bible, then you can dismiss them because the Christians only accept the Bible as the final rule of faith. God's Word is the standard of truth. Nobody else's Word. No matter how gifted somebody is, if they dismiss the Bible or try to substitute something else for the Bible or place other writings on par with the Bible, then you can write them off. And it turns out that this little lady passed that test too. Actually, I don't really know of too many people who have tried harder than Ellen White to get people to go back to the Bible and the Bible only as their rule of faith. Here's what she said. Cling to your Bible as it reads and stop your criticisms in regard to its validity and obey the word and not one of you will be lost. Now she wrote this at a time when even Christians were starting to critique the Bible and buy into the theory of evolution. She wrote this during a century when, so -called, when a so-called prophet named Joseph Smith had insisted that the Bible was corrupted and he had another book written to replace it. Throughout her entire lifetime Ellen White pleaded with people to turn back to the Bible. Quit questioning it, she said. Quit criticizing it. Just believe what it says and start living it. Ellen White was a huge fan, a huge proponent of that great Christian Protestant principle. She said, there is need of a return to the great Protestant principle, the Bible and the Bible only, as the rule of faith and duty. So does it sound like she was a woman that disparaged the Bible? Not at all. Did she agree with the Bible? Yes, she did. Ellen White would have loved repeating our little saying, if it's in the Bible, and if it's not in the Bible, her voice would have been louder than all yours put together tonight. So, in fact, when people started believing that she might have the prophetic gift, some of them got a little too excited by the things she was writing, and she actually had to rebuke them because they were elevating her books to the status of the Bible. And what she said absolutely confirms that she had the right attitude. She said, but don't you quote Sister White, quote the Bible. Talk the Bible. It's full of meat, full of fatness. Carry it right out in your life. And, and let me stop right there for a moment and say something very important because there's this, this misconception floating around that Seventh-day Adventists base their beliefs on extra-biblical writings. I've had many people tell me that over the years, that somehow we think that a prophetic gift like Ellen White's takes the place of Scripture or adds to the Scripture. So let me ask you, because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist preacher, we've been here, this is the 23rd meeting we've come to. What book have we been studying from every night? It's the Bible, folks. Where do we get all of our information? 
from the Bible because that's who Seventh-day Adventists are. They are known as a people of the book. In fact, Ellen White, towards the end of her ministry, she was at one of our, our large world gatherings called the General Conference, and they had asked her to speak, and she was giving one of the messages that night. And then it looked like she was done and she went to sit down. But right before she sat down, the story says that she turned around and at the age of 80 some years, with a sprightly step, she walked back to the edge of the platform because there were some men sitting on the front row that she felt were placing too much writings, too much emphasis on her writings. And she looked at them and she said, gentlemen, I recommend to you this book. And then she sat down. Because her commitment wasn't to her writings. Her commitment was to the Word of God. She says, my writings are a lesser light leading to the greater light of God's Word. Let me give you an official quote, an official position from the Seventh-day Adventist Church itself. The writings of Ellen White are not a substitute for Scripture. They cannot be placed on the same level. The Holy Scriptures stand alone the unique standard by which her and all other writers must be judged and to which they must be subject. So if you hear somebody saying that, no, we, we, we interpret the Bible based on the writings of Ellen White, that is not what we believe. That is not what we do. We interpret the Bible based on the writings of the Bible and the Bible alone. The Bible is the unique standard by which all other writings must be judged and to which they must be subject. The Bible is the supreme standard. Seventh-day Adventists fully support the Reformation principle of sola scriptura, the Bible as its own interpreter, and the Bible alone as the basis of all doctrines. Is that pretty clear? Good. Let's move on. And we're going to handle the last three points together because they are really manifestations. They're the way we should expect a, proof to, a, a gift to present itself. A real prophet hears from God in dreams and visions. A real prophet may stop breathing in vision. And sometimes the vision comes with supernatural feats of strength. And this was true of Ellen White. She didn't use crystal balls or tarot cards or tea leaves. It was always dreams and visions. And sometimes... Very interesting things took place during those visions. On one occasion, she suddenly picked up an 18-pound family Bible and held it over her head for 30 minutes, just like this. And while she was holding it over her head, the Bible was open, and she would reach up without looking and flip the pages and start pointing and quoting another scripture. And of course, someone in the room was really curious, and so he got up on a chair to see if she was getting them right. And she was, every single one of them, and nobody could figure it out. And I don't know if you've ever tried to hold 18 pounds up like this for 18... Have you ever tried to hold a penny up like this for 18 minutes? It's physically impossible. One Mr. Universe, Mr. Universe himself, who, by the way, was a Seventh-day Adventist, but he, he heard what she had done, and he tried to hold the same Bible the same way, and he made it for eight minutes. That's it. And she did it for 30. You've got to ask yourself, how could that happen? Now, just because she did something miraculous doesn't make her a prophet, but it fits with the evidence of the Bible. On, on other occasions, Ellen White went into vision. People held up candles and mirrors to her nose to see if she was breathing, and she wasn't. In fact, there was one skeptic who was convinced she was faking, and he went to check her breath because he knew what the Bible said. And up on the platform, it says, they say, everybody in the room says, he suddenly turned pale and ran out of the room yelling, she's not breathing, she's not breathing. So Ellen White's gifts seem to match. It seems she had the real thing. And honestly, that's kind of exciting because the Bible says that in the last days, you and I should expect to find it among God's people. Let's go back to Revelation 12 one more time. It says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The Bible clearly talks about the prophetic gift re-emerging in the last days, and so you and I should expect to find it. We shouldn't be surprised by it if it happens. Now, to be clear, the Seventh-day Adventist Church does not demand that its members accept the prophetic gift of Ellen White. The Bible never says that a prophet would come along by the name of Ellen White, but it does say that the prophetic gift and all the gifts will be present among God's people clear up to the time that Jesus comes. And so we do ask that people accept that it is possible to have that prophetic gift available in God's church at the end of time. And if the real thing happens, 
Wouldn't you want to know about it? This is something you wouldn't want to miss. Now, there's one more thing that I want you to think about as you think about this remnant movement as a whole. And this is something that Jesus said. He says, therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. You know, people can say all they want that they're genuine Christians. But if the fruit doesn't match, then you need to be very careful. So what has this last day remnant movement of God produced? Well, first of all, it's produced exactly the right message. The message you should expect them to be preaching in the last days. Revelation chapter 14 says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And as I mentioned just the other night, there's only two organizations, two religious organizations that are in every nation in the world. And those are the Catholic Church and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. There's actually a lot to think about in that, but we're saying that the hour of His judgment has already started, and we are worshiping God as Creator by keeping the fourth commandment that was quoted right there in the first angel's message. Secondly, it has produced the largest missionary movement in the world with 80 times as many missionaries as any other group out there. Not twice as many, not three times as many, 80 times as many. Why? Because they know their job is to take God's final message to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And the Seventh-day Adventists take that job very seriously. One of the pastors, one of my fellow pastors that was working with me up in Pittsburgh, he, sp he pastored a different church in Pittsburgh than I did, but it was phenomenal. He had been a, a, a minister overseas in Indonesia in some of the most remote cannibalistic places on the world, and my goodness, did he have some stories to tell. How God protected him, all kinds of stories. But folks, that's the kind of commitment that it takes to reach these people and reach them they have some amazing, amazing stories. But that missionary movement is very important. Thirdly, it has produced one of the biggest healthcare systems in the world, including the famous Loma Linda Hospital that you see right there on the screen, where the first baby heart transplants in the world were done, and where they developed proton treatments for prostate cancer. In fact, the medical system in the Adventist Church is so big that in the state of Florida, the biggest hospital system in the state of Florida, Advent Health as it's now called, it's run by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The second biggest medical system in the state of Ohio, Kettering Medical Center, is run by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. All over this country and all around the world, hundreds and hundreds of hospitals run because we care about health. And why do we care so much about people's health? <clears throat> it's because we know that Jesus spent more time healing than preaching. And it's because we know that God wants people to prosper and be in health. And we want to do our part. This last day movement is providing right now humanitarian relief, relief in at least 119 countries. Right now. You remember the earthquakes and hurricanes that hit Haiti? Everybody else is gone. We're still there. You remember the tsunami in Indonesia? We're still there. Why? Because God cares about suffering. That's why. I remember when I pastored down in Franklin, West Virginia, in the thriving metropolis of Franklin. If you've ever been to Pendleton County, there's not much there, but there is Franklin. And when I got there, we did something called in-gathering where we were going to the community and trying to raise funds to, for disaster relief in and around West Virginia. That's what we were doing. And so we did that. And as we started going to the you know, well, we work in conjunction with the Red Cross and VOAD, which is a state agency. And we, we had all these different things going on. And so many people said to us, oh, we, we don't like the Red Cross. Who is this? And I didn't, I didn't know the history. I was the pastor there, but I didn't know the history of what the Adventist church had done in that town. Years before that, there had been a flood. And the Red Cross moved in, and all the state agencies and the government agencies moved in. All these different agencies moved in. And they, they gathered up all this stuff that was supposed to be distributed to them, and then they packed it up and took it out of town. But guess what? A year later, the Seventh-day Adventist church was still there helping people get drywall and helping them put drywall up on their houses and their, their houses and the parts of them that were flooded. And the people remembered that. So at least when I was in that town, I would just tell people, we're the Seventh-day Adventist church and we're raising money for disaster relief. And they're like, oh, thank you. And we had no problem raising money in that town whatsoever because when they come, they tend to stay much, much longer than other organizations because we're not just there 
to make a name for ourselves. We're there to actually help people. And let me just say, the amount of money that the Seventh-day Adventist Church spent in Franklin is far more than the amount of money the Seventh-day Adventist Church ever received from every Seventh-day Adventist in the state of West Virginia for 10 years running. It is amazing the commitment that they make. When we work together as a whole, we can do things that an individual out there on their own can't do. That's why, that's why Paul said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. We need each other to accomplish God's purpose. But we're still in these places because we care about people when they're suffering. And more importantly, this movement has produced millions, over 23 million now, vibrant Christians from every imaginable walk of life and they're working together in every country to prepare the world for Jesus to come. This movement is bringing millions of people to Christ, thousands every single day of the top 15 denominations in the world. We're the only one that's still growing and we are the fastest growing denomination anywhere in the world because that's all that matters really in these last few days, years before Jesus comes is that we let the world know that Jesus comes. It's not just that we know that Jesus is coming. We want others to know that Jesus will do for them what he's doing for us. The salvation and the hope of a second coming. And most importantly of all, this last day movement of God is getting the world ready for Jesus to come. This morning I, I'm, I have a special gift for you. I'm, I'm going to give you a book. One of the best books I've ever read outside the Bible on how to become a Christian and have a better relationship with Christ. It was written by Ellen White. And I'm giving it to you, especially if you're not a member, I'm giving it to you because I want you to take it home and read it for yourself and enjoy it. And if you find that it's biblical and Christ-centered, then add it to your library and use it. And if you find that it contradicts the Bible, throw it out. I guess my, my last point this morning is this. What is the gift that God has given you? What is the there is the gift of salvation. That's the main gift. That's the one gift that everybody gifts. That's a gift of Jesus. But what's the gift of the Spirit that God has given you? What's, what, what's the passion that God has put in your heart? If you could do anything for God and you knew it would not fail, what would that be? How would you want God to use you? I want you to think about that because the Bible says that we all have gifts and this morning, I promise you that you, every one of you in this room, are called by God. This sinful world of ours really needs Jesus. And, and, and God is calling you with the gifts and talents that you have to be part of taking the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So what is your gift? What is your passion? Are you willing to use that gift? for God's cause. In your heart of hearts, I'm going to ask you one more time. Have you really made that commitment that says, yes, Jesus, because of what you've done for me, I want to live my life your way. My prayer is that as difficult as it can be, each of you will make that deep, heartfelt commitment to God. Right now, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for these folks that have come out night by night to listen to these meetings. I want to thank you for the fact that I know the Holy Spirit is working on the hearts and minds of people even as we, even as we pray right now. He's working on them throughout the day. And I just pray, Father, that each person will come to you with an open and honest heart and do your will, not necessarily mine. Do your will. Please send your spirit an extra measure on each person here and on each person that's been coming night by night. And I just pray that you will bless us so that we can help others know that Jesus saves them and he's coming back too. Give us wisdom, give us courage, give us energy so that we can accomplish your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And you guys